So hopefully you're all here to be able to find out how you can make your software better and solve some complex problems. If you have a bit of toothache, I'm afraid to tell you that you're in the wrong room. I do apologize um, for the misleading title. But hopefully uh, you're in the right room and you're going to get an opportunity to, you know, to learn a lot today. Um, I will try and leave a lot of time for questions. Um, so if possible, uh, you know, try and you know, leave your questions to the end. But if you do have something pressing that you want to ask, feel free to ask as well uh, you know, during the presentation. I do not mind uh, you know, taking any questions. But yes, uh, root canal surgery. Who here actually likes going to the dentist and getting some root canal surgery? It's good to know you're full of a room of full of normal people. I personally hate going to the dentist. I try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, I only go to the dentist if I really, really, really need it. So if I'm at the dentist, there's a good chance I can't eat my food. Uh, you know, so I need to get something sorted out. And I think. That's kind of what it's like when it comes to dentistry and root canal surgery. You know, when it comes to our teeth, they need to look good, so we'll brush our teeth all the time. We need to make sure we've got great smiles. But really, uh, you know, sometimes, no matter how much cosmetic changes you make, you're going to have to go in and you're going to have to get some deep work done on your teeth to sort out some deep, complex problems. And I think it's the same with software. There's only so much that we can sometimes do, you know, to patch a burning bush before we sometimes need to consider there's a better approach uh, to the way that we're doing this. And hopefully we'll be able to unpack some of that in today's talk. Um, great. A little bit about me before I uh, you know, go too far. Uh, I, my name is Craig Reesey. I am a software architect for a company called REPL, recently bought out by Accenture. Um, uh, my background is probably more in software testing and quality engineering. Um, but really, you know, my responsibility is to work with organizations, help them build and design test frameworks, but then also solve a lot of their problems to make their software better. Um, some of you may also uh, have seen me for, from Snapped. I do some writing for Snapped and some technical consultancy. Uh, they're a company that's a uh, Cape Town-based company that does a lot of load balancing uh, and application delivery controllers. So if you work in multi-cloud um, and you need some help on that side, they're one of the best in the business. Uh, and then some of you might also know me from Risky Games. Um, I have my own board game brand. Um, I've published 10 board games with an 11th coming out next month. Uh, so yeah, I love to play games. Um, so if you ever want to play some games, feel free to download them. They're free. Uh, I don't believe you should pay to have fun. Great. Back to my talk. So yeah, today I really want to talk about getting to the root of the problem. Like I said earlier on, I think too often we focus on fixing symptoms when it comes to software. We're working in our software, we find a bug, we're like, oh, you, know, I, you know, we've got this bug. Either it's urgent and it's in production, you need to get it fixed, or it's maybe during your testing phase, but you know what, it's the end of sprint tomorrow, so we're going to just do whatever we can to make sure that it's done and we tick the boxes. So what we do is we just do you know, some sort of quick patch to make sure that it works and it passes the test and we're good to go. Uh, and we think that's great, we fixed and we solved the problem. But then the next sprint, the same thing happens. And in the next sprint, the same thing happens. Uh, and it keeps going on where we keep finding common bugs, common problems, and the same faults throughout our software delivery. And we never really get to the point of, well, you know, when can we get to the point when we actually stop making these bugs? Uh, and you might look at your own team and think, yeah, you know, we, we, we keep repeating these mistakes. Now scale that out to an organization of 30, 40 sprint teams, all making the same mistake all the time. Um, that gets expensive, that becomes a problem. So we need to get to the root of the problem and not fix symptoms all the time. Um, sorry, click it. So yeah, we tend to fix the system, I, I, so I mean symptoms and not the root causes. And I think the reason why this is important is, firstly, it's wasted effort. So when we look at you know, all the work that we're getting into patching to make our software look great and to solve all these different issues, we waste a lot of effort because we're not actually realizing that, yes, we're fixing this out and we think it's a quick fix, it's good to go, uh, you know, we're smart, uh, but then we keep doing it every single time. Uh, you know, we, we keep fixing the same problems, the same issues repeatedly, and that's wasted effort. Um, you know, it's increased testing effort. So it's not just about the matter of, okay, well, we're fixing these issues and then we find some more bugs and then we fix them again. What about the testing? testers and all the testing effort that goes into that. They end up doing a lot more regression testing. Even if it's all automated, it's still a lot of extra regression running that's going on. That takes time. It slows you down. Um, and it's a lot of wasted thing, wasted effort. 
you're creating technical debt. You're causing problems. Uh, you know, and you, you, you like, might not realize at the time because you think we're just trying to get things done and move on to the next delivery cycle, the next delivery cycle. But if you're constantly patching over issues, bigger issues, all you're doing is creating a massive tech debt problem. So we need to get out of the habit of doing that. Uh, and then I guess lastly, it's, it, it's the excess maintenance. It adds up over time. It slows your delivery. We all want to be agile. We all want to be able to get our software out there from start to finish as fast as possible. But if we're going to just be doing quick fixes all the time, long term, we're actually going to end up with slow software delivery. And no one wants it. So we definitely need to get this quicker. But one thing that as well, which I really don't like about it, is that it creates a bug culture where we think it's OK to log bugs. We think it's OK to have bugs. Um, and then to fix bugs, and then we have testers go, and then the, the testers have got this thing, I need to now find as many bugs as possible. And we celebrate this, you know, we found 15 bugs, or we found 20 bugs, and we fixed them. Um, and that's the wrong culture to have, because we shouldn't be focusing on trying to fix bugs, or trying to find bugs. We should be focusing on trying to prevent them in the first place. We shouldn't be finding any bugs. We should be celebrating the fact that we get through entire delivery cycles, and there's no bugs, and we can trust the work that we've done. Has anyone ever experienced that? Exactly. Uh, you know, so we, we really need to start changing the way that we go about you know, approaching these problems and software defects uh, within, our, within our companies. Uh, and so yeah, we need to focus on getting to the root of the problem, not just fixing what looks obvious, but actually figuring out why did this happen in the first place. So most companies will have something like this. It's a typical bug, bug life cycle. Someone in the team finds a bug. We assign it. Uh, we try and fix it. Or maybe we decide it's not a bug, but whatever it might be. It gets retested. If it passes, we're verified, we're happy, and we close it. And we leave it there. But there's a problem with that. That's very incomplete. And you might have a slightly more sophisticated bug life cycle than this one. Um, but the point is, most of the times it gets, the, gets there, and we're just happy to close the bugs and move on, and then we repeat the cycle, we repeat the cycle. But let me ask you this question. Sorry, just trying to see if it clicks. There we go. If you don't know what caused the issue, can you really consider a defect closed? And I want you to think about this, you know, yes, we know, OK, great, we found this bug, might have been a UI, something wrong with the API, something didn't go right, um, and now we fixed it. But why did it happen? What caused it? Why did that defect appear in the first place? What went wrong? Do we really understand that? And if we don't, why are we closing the defects in the first place? Why are we saying it's closed? Yes, this is working now, let's move on. But why did it happen? We're not asking the right questions. We're too quick to move on and get to the next cycle of delivery without really dealing with the real problem. How about this one? If you can't guarantee how to prevent the issue from reappearing, have you really fixed it? Do we ask ourselves this? We say we fixed the bug, great. So that means it's never, ever, ever going to happen, and you're never going to repeat that same problem in the next Next projects. No. We, we keep on repeating mistakes. You know, we, we keep on making the same mistakes. We keep on getting into these common issues. Have we really fixed the problem if we're going to repeat the mistake again? If we're going to run into the same problem? Servers fell down. Great. We got them up and running again. Next week, they fall down again. Same reason. We need to just add more memory. Let's add more memory. It's not going to solve the problem. You're not fixing the root of why your server is going down. You can't just patch over it by thinking adding more memory is going to solve it. You've got to get it right. So what we, have, what we essentially need to do is get to what I'd like to call root cause. I think most people have heard of some form of, you've got to get to the root cause, root cause analysis. But I think often with root cause, we don't do it properly. And we need to shift the thinking from not just how the defect occurred, but what can be done to prevent, to prevent it from happening again. We're too quick to have a root cause and say, the root cause was this. The system went down because it ran out of memory. That's not a root cause. Why did it run out of memory? What can we do to prevent it from running out of memory in the future? 
Um, you know, and we've got to start asking a lot of deeper questions. And that's the purpose of what looking at a real root cause is about. It's not about just fixing the problem and then allocating that fix to something. It's really about trying to understand the deeper thing you know, of why it happened in the first place. So what does it take if we now want to get there and we want to create this culture where we can really fix our issues properly? I think it starts with collaboration. Um, we shouldn't be having someone log in the defect, assign in it here, and they're very separated, and they're not working well together. We've got to work well together. We've got to work together as a team. And the reason why I say that is you're going to assign something to a developer. He's going to look at his code. He's going to see on my code what went wrong. He might say, well, that went wrong. I'm going to fix it. But why did it go wrong? Sometimes the issue might not even be with their code. Maybe there's a design problem. Maybe there's a requirements issue somewhere else. But if we get the whole team together to talk about it, we can have a better understanding of it. I think it's also important that we don't do blame shifting when it comes to these things. It shouldn't be, you know, there's this defect, uh, you know, and then and we're like, well, it's this dev's fault or it's this person's fault over here. He didn't write good enough requirements for me, so I programmed it that way. And you know, it's not about trying to, bl sh you know, bl sh lift. It's not about trying to blame shift. You know, it's really about trying to work together as a team to be able to better understand how we can get better at doing this. Uh, so we need to, again, stop that isolation and start working together as a team to tackle issues in a big way. It starts off with asking questions. A lot of these are very common questions that you know, we, you know, we, we should be asking. What does the defect issue look like in production? Not just we found something, but what does it look like? What's actually occurring? You know, going through you know, some, some details. What is causing it to occur? Do we actually know what's causing it to occur? We can see it happening. Why? What's, what's causing it to occur? What specific step, what specific events are triggering this? Where is it occurring? Uh, you know, is it occurring on a particular front page? Is it you know, occurring on a particular uh, you know, API that's calling a particular service, and we can trigger it there? How do we fix it? You know, obvious thing. And then, how do we ensure it doesn't happen again? It's, you know, a, again, a question which I've asked before. But I think it then also requires us to ask a lot more deeper questions. Do we have clear requirements? When I started, and this really applies to everyone, again, it's not about blame shifting. It's not about placing the blame on the business analyst writing better requirements. If I'm a developer and I'm given requirements and I have any questions on it, it's my duty to ask. If I'm a tester and I'm working on a project and there's something that I don't quite understand, it's my duty to ask. We should all be doing that. We should always be asking, you know, do we have clear requirements? Do I really understand how the system is supposed to behave? Do I really have all the parameters of what's going to happen when this thing gets deployed into production? Or am I just doing what someone told me to do? We've got to be asking ourselves those questions. Do we make any technical assumptions? I think too often, particularly in large organizations, we tend to follow this process of, you know, you know, we're going to build a new microservice for this particular feature. Why? Because that's what we do. We're a microservices company. We build things in a microservice architecture. Is that the right approach to solving that problem? Have we actually looked at it and thought about it holistically? Uh, you know, we've got to think about these things deeper and actually understand and look at all these technical assumptions we've made and sometimes reevaluate them. Because I think too often we're trying to fix these things of, well, we've gone down this path, it has to be fixed down this way, without stopping ourselves and actually asking the question of, have we made a, maybe made a mistake in the way that we've tried to approach this problem in the first place? We've got to solve that. What data or constraints are causing the issue? Data, you know, and I'm, you know, it's worth mentioning because I think data causes a lot of issues. We, what, we, what we sometimes expect and how we expect you know, data to work is very different to how it actually works in production. Um, and so we often tend to develop and test you know, down certain permutations and they go into production and the users do something completely different with it. Um, so what are those constraints? Do we actually understand the issue? What are some of the things that we need to think about? You know, what's holding us back when it comes to constraints? What actually can we use on our virtual machines uh, you know, that are running us in production? What actually is the limitations we need to work with? Have we designed for that adequately? Um, thinking about those things. How does the issue impact security and performance? Everyone will say that security and performance is, is important, but do you actually understand what that means when you're working on a feature? You know, we're just trying to, again, get, get things out as fast as possible. 
um, and then we have some bugs and then we fix some bugs and then inevitably what happens is you tend to slow things down. Um, uh, and we don't actually look at, again, what are we actually trying to, tr trying to achieve? Have we actually thought about how this has been used in a secure manner and the impact that has on performance as well? We've got to be asking ourselves this question. What are similar pieces of code used in the software? And this is particularly a problem with big organizations. You're too isolated, you work in scrum teams, you fix it in your code. There might be many other teams that have got dependencies on that code you just fixed. Or, even worse, are making the same mistakes because they approach the problem in the same way you approach that coding problem in the same way. So, what you're doing is you're just seeing issues escalate, 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 and you're not actually fixing problems, you're just creating more problems. Because now you might have fixed it in your team, but every other team's now got an issue because you made that fix. And now they're trying to fix it in a different way, and then you're just creating more long-term issues. So, again, it's not healthy. Um, uh, and then, yeah, how can this code be tested better? You know, in everything, we've got to think about the testing approach. We can't just design a software or code our software for how it's going to be built. We need to also remember that it needs to be tested as well, and it needs to preferably be automated. Uh, and if you haven't designed your software with automation in mind, that it can actually run quite quickly, you need to go back. Uh, and this is why I actually always encourage testers, also I mean devs, to write really extensive unit tests. And ask your tester for ideas, and they can give you a whole list of things you need to do. And if you say, yeah, but I can't test that in a unit test. It needs something else. Rethink about the way you're writing your code. If you can't be unit tested, there's a good chance you're doing something wrong in the code. Um, so it's something to think about. I think we too often, again, don't think, you know, we're like just trying to think of just our layer getting our work done and not focus enough on how it impacts the rest of the team. Now, you might be, be hearing this and thinking, that's, that's a lot of work. Uh, Craig, I understand you. We need to get to the root cause of issues. We need to solve things deeper. We've, you know, we need to ask ourselves a lot of these questions. I just can't see it happening in my company. Um, it's just too much. Uh, you know, it's one thing for yeah, the one or two issues that we might have faced along the way, but you know, the problem is that we're an organization and we've got 200 defects that we need to deal with. We don't have the time to ask all these questions, and I'd say you're probably right. Um, I don't think any company has the ability to really spend time fixing their issues on a deeper level all the time. You just can't because you need to push delivery all the time. You've got deadlines, you've got expectations from business to be able to, you know, to deliver new functionality. You've got things that need to get done. If you really have to spend all your time fixing a problem properly, you're probably never gonna get anything done, at least from a business perspective. You might feel great about yourself. The company's gonna be like, what are these guys, you know, what are these guys doing here? Let's get rid of them. They've delivered no new features over the past three months. They refactored software, what does that mean? So it is a bit of a trade-off, it's difficult to do, which is why I think the best way to go about solving this problem is trend analysis. You're not gonna solve all the problems. Uh, and I want to just make that clear, you're never gonna solve all the problems, at least not initially. So you've got to start finding out how do we go about choosing which problems to solve. And that's why it's important to have you know, some way of categorizing. I mentioned earlier on about the root cause thing, actually having a root cause you know, in, your, you know, in your defect life cycle. If you're a company that doesn't have a root cause field in your defect life cycle, please put one in. Uh, and I'll be honest, I think you know, a lot of times what we put in those fields is probably garbage, and it starts out with garbage, but over time, the more we use it, the more you find you'll start getting better data. Uh, and really what you want to do is in that root cause field indicate what went wrong and why did it go wrong. And you want to ask yourself those questions and put yourself answers. And you need to put it. So if you're using, let's say, Jira to track your defects, you actually have a field there and you start labeling them. And you prevent defects from being closed until someone's actually put a value in those fields. And then you start capturing that data. So they're answering questions. They might not be fixing the issue properly, but they're answering those questions. And then over time, what it does is it allows you to get to a point where you're realizing, okay, great. Well, we now know 26.8% of all the issues that are happening in our company are happening at a code level. Why? So we know that the mistake was made not because the requirements were wrong, not because the design is bad, but because the developers made a mistake. Developers are going to make mistakes, so partly that's realistic. We, you know, we're human, we're going to make mistakes, great. But now let's start asking the questions. What can we do to get the devs better? Is it better training? Is there something wrong with their skills and what we're expecting them to do with the skills? 
You know, are they overworked? Uh, there's a lot of things that we can now start asking and go, okay, great, now let's really understand why is the developer making the mistake? Do they need more coffee? Do they need more free food? Are we paying them right? There's a lot of things, but we know, okay, there is something to solve. Often it can be requirements. It can be design issues that are getting highlighted. And this is important because, again, as an organization, you're not going to have time to solve every single problem. But what you can try and do is identify the one or two big issues and start with those. So if 26.8% of your issues are coming because developers made a mistake, um, you can start working towards that. You can start asking the, those questions and trying to figure out how do we help them write better code. And there's a, you know, I'm not going to go into all the solutions of how you can do that, but what you need to start doing is getting into some form of trend analysis where you can at least start to understand. Use the data to tell you things. You can also have things like defect types, and you can put some trends in place where we okay, great, we've picked up a defect, and often we just log a defect. Okay, what type of defect did you log? Was it a, was it a feature defect? Was it something new that we were working on, uh, and now we've logged a defect? Was it a regression defect picked up through our regression tools? So in other words, we broke something else along the way. You know, is it a performance defect, uh, data, data defect, security defect? Did, you know, was there a system, you know, system outage? Put a label to it. Historic defect, something that was actually always in the code, but now we've just found it. So it was historic, so it was something way back. But let's, or a known defect where you actually knew it was wrong in the first place, but you deployed it anyway. Put a label to it. Again, it's just putting a label to things so you start to understand what's going on. And I think that data helps you to create a better picture. What modules were affected? Uh, you know, we're in the application business. You know, is this failure occurring? Uh, you know, because often, when you start doing that, and you can track which, which parts of the application were causing the most failures, that again also then gives you an indication, okay, great, we can't fix everything. But this one API is really bad. We need to fix that. And then we can spend time and invest on it. Uh, what's the importance and complexity of that? Obviously, some things are more important than others. Some things are more complex than others. You, know, you might have a particular feature that's quite buggy, but ultimately not that important. You know, is it worth really investing that time doing it right? So it's just asking yourself those questions so that you can approach it properly. Um, and then again, putting root causes in those data. So we want to assign something, so we've got to assign an issue. Now, there is a multitude of things. I've put six here. Uh, in the organization I work for, we've got 24 root causes that we try and categorize. Um, uh, and it's all variants of these, but it's really just trying to understand where did the fault lie. Uh, and what we do with these, just so you guys know, is the team's got to decide. Because if you're going to tell the dev, you know, or, you know like tester, please make sure there's a root cause in there, he's automatically going to blame the dev. If you tell the dev, he's going to blame the analyst or the tester. The tester missed this. You know, the tester missed it, but why did the tester miss it? So it's again, it's trying to think about those things, and it's taking team accountability for the whole team needs to agree that that's your root cause field and putting that in. Things like coding errors. Was it a design error, a data error? Have we thought about this? A deployment error. I think a lot of times we don't realize that we're actually making a mistake at the deployment phase. And so what actually happened in production was not that the code was wrong, it's that we made a mistake in deployment. Have we thought about that? Environment issues. And environment issues are a particularly difficult one, or you know, often something that we don't always realize, because what we're testing and what we're actually deploying to are very different things. And they behave differently. And now we wonder why it was working there and not there. Um, it worked on my machine, but it's not working in production. Well, because they're different environments. Uh, if it works on your machine, that doesn't mean that your machine is production. Let's plug your machine into the internet. Great. Cool. How's that going to go? So we, again, we've got to understand those things, yeah, understand the differences between what we're building, developing, and testing in versus what's actually going on in our environment, and then performance errors. You know, and again, this is just a high-level view of things, but we need that data. We need that data in there. And if we can capture that data, we can start to assign things for the root causes. And then again, if you need some help with root causes, you can start digging, digging into these things. So let's take a look at requirement issues, for instance. We know, OK, it's a requirement issue, but you know, was the requirement description? It was inadequate. We didn't have enough information. What was wrong there? You know, maybe a use case was not captured. Our requirements were fine, but we didn't consider every single type of client. How do we get better with that? You know, communication gap between business and development team. That can be a root cause completely on its own. and something we need to factor in, and that could be one of those lists that you put in there. This is a communication gap that we need to fix, and it's trying to understand that. And I'm saying all of these things, and it might sound like, but Craig, these are mostly people problems or culture problems that you're raising, not just technical issues, and that's because it is. 
Yes, there are technical things, and yes, with my job, I spend a lot of time sitting with developers trying to solve technical problems to help them design their code better. But it's the culture change that's allowed me to get there in the first place. And if you don't have a culture change of wanting to actually get to a point where we're now actually finding the root cause of the issues and we're tackling those big things and starting to get better to ensure that we're finding less defects and having less of a bug culture, we're not going to get there. So you can go through those things and just realize that, again, it's not just a coding issue. You can start working down and start asking questions with, with your code to start you know, really understanding. And each of those, those line items can become a root cause on their own that you're now capturing as a team and trying to identify. And you're using that data to now go and filter and say, okay, well, we've got all these defects across the company um, or within our own team if you want to start small. Um, we can't fix all of them, we can't get to the root cause of all of them, but we know that these three areas are big issues. And we know what, you know, and we know what's, let's, let's figure out what's causing them. Let's find those solutions. Let's look at a point where we can prevent them from happening again and work towards that. It might be an organizational change, it could be a design change, it could be a testing change, it could be a dev change, whatever it might be, but we need to ask those questions and dig deeper into it. And then what the data also allows us to do is allows us to measure change. Um, so again, we're creating a lot of these issues and we're capturing all this data about what went wrong, but now we've got to actually measure that the changes are taking into effect. Uh, uh, and so how do we do that? Well, let's say we're logging a lot of defects. We've had 40 production defects a month. We need to start getting to a point where it's 35 or 30. Uh, and those particular root causes that we want to target, we should start seeing those numbers go down. So we've got to use that data that we're gathering from all this information to work towards trying to get better in that way. So I think that's key. Um, I was working with a company several years ago um, where there was this one team. So we used to have this culture of we, would, we only logged production defects. We actually don't care what you do in your sprint teams. Um, you know, if you find a bug and you sit next to the dev, tell him if he fixes it, that's great. I don't need to know about that. That's cool. We only logged stuff that went into production and it had to have a root cause and stuff like that. But then there was this one team that had a couple of development cycles where they would put something into a UAT environment and we would find over 100 defects. Um, and that happened more than once. And I got to a point where I was like, you know what? You guys are going to log everything. Every single thing that you guys find, even if it's at a bug phase, your unit has failed, I want you to log it. It sounds like a lot of work, but please do it. And they pushed back a lot. They were like, this is this is madness, they pushed back, they went to management, management was fortunate enough, willing to say, just try his methods, we've employed him to fix it, trust him. So they got frustrated. But what it did, it started giving me the data to be able to say, okay, great, we've done, done this for several sort of sprint cycles, now I've got the data to know where your problems are, and now I can start solving them. And then what they would do is, you know, we'd then have another sprint after that, after we've made some remediations, all of a sudden they were like, hey, there's less. We're finding less issues. You know, even my unit testing is getting better. So the dev, you know, so the, 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 the tester is speaking to the dev less because the code's working better. You know, we're not having these requirement conversations anymore because we're getting better at it. And I could fix that problem, fix that problem. And they, they got to a point where they were now working like a well-oiled machine and now we're, they were going into production or to UAT and we'd maybe find maybe just two or three really complicated defects that, you know, it's kind of understandable that they maybe missed that. And it all was because we got the data and we could fix the data and we could put plans in place and then measure that improvement. So that's important. We need the data. And I think that's, that's the secret of really what I want to talk about, or, you know, what my presentation's about, is that we need to get to the root cause of issues. Um, I'm not going to come and tell you what those root cause of issues are because I don't know what they are in your, in your project, in your company. There's a lot of things that causes, causes issues. But what I can tell you is that you need to tackle them. You need to fix your software correctly. You can't just keep patching over bad code. At some point in time, it's going to fall over. You need to get to a point where you are doing the right thing, where you are fixing it properly. But to get there, you need the data. To get there, you need to make sure that you have what it is that you need so that you can start building the priorities in place uh, and making the right mitigations so that you can get there and solve your problems. Cool. That's the end of my talk. Um, so I want to just leave some time for you guys to ask me questions. Um, and there is a microphone, so there we go. How's it? Hi. Um, great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. What do you do when 
in your course of your, or your process of roots analysis that uh, you get blocked where you can't find the actual root cause and you can sink more time into it, but you just don't have that. Yeah. Um, that happens, and I think that's a good point. Um, so one of the fields that we have in my organization uh, is the word, like, don't know. So we, we actually have a root cause of we don't know. And that's okay. We've kind of got comfortable with it. We get uncomfortable with it if we've got a lot of we don't knows. But we have nothing wrong with a team selecting we don't know, particularly if it's a minor issue. You don't know why it happened. We can't really reproduce it, but it's you know, a bit of a weird one. We actually don't know. We've looked at it for quite a while. You know, you've got to weigh up that benefit. If there's something really important and really big that's going to cause a lot of problems in production, I would say spend the time on the investigation. If it's something minor, it's probably not worth your effort. Just put we don't know. Um, and that's okay. I sometimes think we don't always have to have a definitive answer, at least not yet. But what you might do is over time, realize it. But at that point in time, you don't. Thank you. Um, if anyone's got any more questions, I am going to just quickly check uh, the remote audience if they've got any questions. Um, great, there's a question. When working in the contractor space, devs don't have the opportunity to choose the priority and clients will always push for new fe features over refactoring. Do you have any suggestions for making room to do a good root cause analysis and going back to fix them? I think that's a great question. I think uh, I'm in the consulting space. Uh, I think one of the key things about this is again, gathering that data and using that data uh, you know, to help the client or the teams change. Uh, when I've walked into companies and made suggestions of let's start tracking root cause, I receive a lot of pushback. A lot of companies are like, why? It's like wasted effort. This is, you know, we want to get faster. We don't want to slow down all the time because you wanted to constantly go back and figure out what the wrong, you know, what's wrong with the software. So what I do is I just add the root cause field anyway. Um, it sounds bad, but I just do it anyway. I'm like, okay, great. I need a root cause. Just give me something quick. 90% of the time, it's garbage data. That's great. I don't mind. I take that garbage data to management, and I tell management, here's your garbage data. 95% of these issues are because of a software defect. They're going to go to all the devs and go, what happened, guys? Why is 95% of all of our defects your fault? And they're going to be like, but it's not our fault. And they're like, but that's what the data said. Now they're going to start taking it a little bit more seriously. Now they're going to say, okay, great. Well, I need to go and actually update this root cause to make sure it's the right root cause. They're going to start getting invested in it. And then it starts to come. So again, it's using that data to your benefit. Uh, and as a consultancy, um, you might not necessarily be able to influence one team, but you should be able to, again, by starting out with junk data, you start to have a bigger impact, especially when the, the, the client starts to see that, and they're like, well, I don't make sense of this. Uh, and then you start to get the dev house uh, you know, invested, particularly if that dev house is also outsourced and contracted because then the client's going to put even more pressure on them to say, well, you're developing for us, and according to the testers, you suck. Uh, no one wants that discussion. No one, again, wants to place blame, but sometimes you've got to start, start with that to get somewhere. Cool. Yes. Um, just wait for the microphone so that the virtual users can hear us. Thanks. Um, so how do you... In your experience, yeah. does this really slow things down, and is it really that much more work, or is that just a kind of a knee-jerk reaction to suggesting a change in the process? Mm. Probably more the latter. It's probably more of a knee-jerk reaction. Um, people think it slows them down, and maybe initially it does. I think when you first stop, it's like any sort of process. Whereas you know, we're devs, we don't like process. No one wants. To you know, have extra process, extra boxes to tick. We just want things to, to flow smoothly. And they might feel like, oh, it's this you know, extra bit of admin that management wants, and you know, why am I doing this? Uh, so there's definitely that pushback. And it might slow you down initially when you start getting into the habit of it. Um, but when you actually really start to have those conversations, you actually realize a lot of times you will know what the answer is as a, as a team. It's, you know, have a quick team retrospective, and you talk about your defects in your retrospective, I don't know how many teams actually do that, but actually bring up the defects of the raise and say, why did this happen? Um, and you, you find that as a team, you start to get more comfortable with actually starting to label those things. And it doesn't have to take extra time. You can use your retro, which we're going to anyway, to find this information out. Yeah. Um, there's another question over there. 
Um, hi. hi. <laughs> Thanks. Very good speech. Um, so my question is just, um, I heard you said you, you guys have 24 different um, categories you can list it on. Yes. But like, I took down six of them. How do you ensure that you don't diversify so much on the categories that the devs don't get confused or just mark it under a general thing or something like that? So for, to me, the I don't know is a very good one to, to add to that list. But mm. then again, anything with a good enough example can do that. And especially for new people coming onto a team, learning 24 yeah. different categories might be very yeah. intimidating. I wouldn't start with 24. So we've landed up with 24 um, over time as we, as we got, got more data and then start to you know, like extrapolate more data, we've realized, hang on, well, we used to log these this way, but we, they're actually two separate issues. And then we would create one. So I would say start off with, you know, with a small number. Six is probably too small. I'm pretty sure everyone can think of more than six. Um, maybe you start with 10 that you've identified. But you start with that and you start small. And, and, and I think over time, the more you work with it, the more you realize, hang on, these two are maybe not related. Um, uh, and particularly because, like, let's say, for instance, uh, you have design. Is it design at a requirements level? Is it design at the architect level? Is it design at a code level? Is it design somewhere else. So there's a lot of things that you can start thinking about and going deeper and that might need a completely separate approach to fixing. But I would start off smaller and then build, you know, building your way up to more. Cool. Any more questions? I'm just going to check the Slack channel. Okay, we've got a question. Um, a lot of time due to time pressure is decided to just patch rather than refactor to prevent a root cause. Did you have a scenario like this? How do you convince management POs to actually invest the time all the time? Um, yes, you know, I think every company's faced with that. You want to just patch it. Let's just patch it, get it done with, move, move on. I think that's the natural corporate response. That's the natural, natural team response. I've done it many times myself. So it's definitely something which I've faced. So we have that. And I think there's nothing wrong with that initially. Again, it's building that data to figure out what are the big issues. So I'm, I never try and fix every single issue that we're going to find because, again, we would never move forward. Um, I have this, this saying that progress is better than perfection. If we're going to do it perfectly, we'll never get anywhere. So I don't believe you've got to stop and fix every little issue. Again, I use the data to identify where do I need to spend my time. So when I'm with an organization, I'll say, great, we need to at least start capturing this information. Just, just put it down. All that does is it just tells me, even if it's just what's the most important issue, what's the number one thing that I can work on, then let's just work on one thing at a time. And then you start with that. And I think over time, you, you solve that problem, you start to have less issues in it, you start to move a little quicker, then you solve the next one, then you jump on the next one. So we can't tackle everything holistically. We need to tackle it in small pieces. You've got to start and then prioritize and focus on getting this big one down and getting that big one down and getting that big one down. And you've got to think of it long term or from an organizational perspective uh, where you want to try and eventually get all 20 teams producing less bugs at the end of the day. Um, I don't think we're ever going to, and I've never been in a company that's had zero. I would love to say that, um, you know, I've worked in a company that's gone into production. We never had bugs. I would love to get there. I mean, I've had projects that have never had defects in because we, met, we, we, we put the right mitigation measures in place and we're able to address them. And we've actually had a few successful projects which had no defects in. As a company, we still make mistakes when we find them. But it's, all, yeah, it's part of that continuous learning process. But I think what's important is we find the data so that we can know what to work on, as opposed to just working on everything. But that's a good question. Another question there? Okay. Um, so you've collected your data. Mm -hmm. How, like, what statistical methods do you apply beyond like averages and like proportions of your different like error types? Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the common one is the percentage of your error types and what's going on. Uh, I think it's always important to have a severity into that. So it's kind of weighing your severity and then the complexity thing, which I mentioned. Because again, it's, and Vince is going to ask this, 90% of our issues are related to this. It's going to be incredibly difficult to fix. Um, that's going to require completely refactoring the whole code base. That's going to lead to separate discussions and how you're going to approach that is completely different. Uh, and then you have to start asking questions, do we redesign this from scratch, do we not? Sometimes it could be, well, 80% of our issues are here, but you know what, if only 5% of users actually use that, can we live with it? Maybe we focus our attention elsewhere. So I think it's adding other fields to it so that you start thinking about the complexity. How is the customer using it? What's going on with the customers? So how often is this particular module being used? If it's not being used that much, 
it might be very buggy, but you know what? Having one person complain to you multiple times a day is maybe not, not as bad as you think it is, at least not right now. We eventually want to get that client happy, but it's not what we need to work on right now. So it's just, again, trying to understand that, that data. Cool. Thank you. Um, uh, time, is, time is actually up, so yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. If you do have any questions, please feel free to come talk to me during the conference. I will be around. Uh, you can also use the, the Slack channel. I'll be answering questions in the Slack channel. <laughs>